certificate, like that little piece of paper they call the certificate of title for your car. That's not the original. That's merely a extract, or they call it an abstract, actually. The extract is the original. The abstract is every other copy. What this means is that no one in the last 50 or 60 years, it appears, no one is getting original title, not the banks, no one. It is all being vested to the state. No wonder the IRS can come in and take everything because you own nothing. You own nothing because we haven't bothered. To be fair, we, we've been told different things. We've made presumptions. We haven't bothered. Now, this is what I'm going to the heart of before. Don't listen to fools that come in and make slogans to you and say, you don't need all this, this is all irrelevant, just stand up there, read the Bible, say a few words, mouth off and, and be incompetent. You know, just get rid of those people. Those people are there, waste our time. Don't let them waste our time. Here is the real proof of taking the effort to do the discovery. Not by presumption, but by forensic, clear, competent knowledge of what the hell is going on. Now, under the estates, we go to the Wills Act of 1837. It could not be clear. If you don't record a will, you do not have a will. If you don't have a will, then clearly it's intestate. And what we discover when we look through, and there's plenty of examples of it, plenty of examples. Here's an example. Let's call it up at the moment as I'm just calling through. Okay, if we go through and we have a look at the Washington uh, examples of recording a deed, then there is an example there where it says, and I don't have it in front of me, but it makes it clear. It says, if you don't get a record at the time, you don't have uh, a, a valid original claim, then your claim is wanting, then someone else can come in and claim over the top of you. We have not been getting effective title. What is title? Title is merely an extract of the name of the record. Title is just a fancy way of getting us an extract of the details that has been entered into the register onto the certificate. If you go and have a look at the statutes for every one of the states and every one of the regions around the Western world, you'll find that most of them provide for what they call a certificate of acknowledgement. The certificate of acknowledgement is what you are supposed to get at the time that you record any kind of deed into their system. It needs to be witnessed, notarized, signed, and of course clearly sealed by the uh, recorder at the time. If you get that, then you have a perfected certificate. You pretty much have a uh, original certificate of title. The other is called, called a certificate of title. They're the same thing, the certificate of title will give you the extract of the record. Certificate of acknowledgement um, usually won't include the details or an actual extract of the record. It will merely state that the events took place. But it is just as strong. Now you can imagine what this means now when we think about issues of foreclosure, with issues of cars, property, all these kinds of things, to realize that no one is getting original title. No one is getting original title. I hope you find that useful and we will be continuing to work with those that are doing the research and doing at the front to find out how they are perfecting the recording of their wills and the recording of deeds and other instruments to ensure we get proper certificate. It's a certificate we need as proof of the public record. That is the key. We need all the paperwork to get there, but we need those certificates in their system. And the system has become so automated that they don't do it anymore. And in fact, most of their people have no idea what we're talking about. Well, we've got about 10 to 15 minutes left. I want to talk about contract quickly, and then I want to talk about banking. So be about another 15 minutes, and then we'll go for questions. I want to raise the question of contract, because this again, was uncovered by the forensic 
and patient work that is taking place in the completion of the canon laws and in the research into the Roman cult. And the disturbing thing of contract is that if you go and look at any of the definitions of contract, what they say is a contract is an agreement and they go on and qualify. Well, I want to state categorically and unequivocally for the public record, a contract is not, is not, I repeat, an agreement. And to prove this, I haven't asked anyone yet to, to do this, but I'm going to ask you, if you could please, to go to One Heaven, and I want you to go to, when you get to One Heaven, uh, which is one-heaven.org, I ask you to go to Positive Law. And when you go to Positive Law, the Canons of Positive Law, I want you to click on the article of Positive Law for Agreement. And that article is article number 109. And I ask you please refresh the page because this has been updated. Well, when we speak of an agreement, there are a number of fundamental elements that an agreement must have. And in Canon 2147, we list them, nine of them. Conformity in accordance with the canons. Okay. There must be independent minds at work, being two or more parties with possessing an independent mind, each having the powers of cognition, free will and intention. Why? If you don't have independent minds, then you can't perform the act of a meeting of minds. And consensus ad item, which is considered one of the two fundamental principles of any legitimate agreement, means that there is a concurrence of wills and a meeting of minds. Well, if there's a meeting of minds, the presumption is there must be two minds. <laughs> There must be. If you don't have two minds, how in the hell can you have a meeting of minds? So independent minds. Good faith. Clear intention of all parties to act ethically. Point three. Point four. Clean hands. Clear intention to avoid any unethical behaviour. Five. Competency and authority. You've got to be authorised to do it. You've got to be competent to know what you're doing. Six. Got to be a legitimate offer. Seven. Valuable consideration. Eight. Remedy and relief. Nine. Well, it says eight there, but should be, be end up, I have to fix this, but it'll be nine is penalties and charges, and ten, mutual assent, which is, as we said, mutual agreement, concurrence of wills, consensus ad item, being a meeting of the minds. That is what seals an agreement. Well, why is a contract then not an agreement? And the reason is in the definition of the word and the meaning of the word. The word contract comes from two Latin words, con, meaning with, and tracto, meaning to handle, deal with, manage, to conduct, or to perform. Literally, the word contract means with performance, conduct, and management. And if we look at the original meanings of the word, coming out of the 18th, late 18th century, it is a promise to perform one or more acts under supervision in exchange for some consideration. That is the meaning of contract. Under supervision, meaning under guardianship. A contract is not an agreement. How? Well, number one, by its very definition, a contract is not a meaning of equals because you're admitting to being unequal. You're assuming roles, more than just simply being an offerer and an offeree, more than just being a buyer and seller. You're identifying a parent and a child. You are not equals in a contract. There is no meeting of minds in a contract. There is no meeting of minds in a contract. Contracts only stand if one remains in consent. Now, if you look at the preferred form 
used by the corporation since they took control. It's not deeds. It's not PACs. It's contracts. Contracts are the preferred form created by the corporation and all their law for enforcement is based on contracts. The maxim that an agreement is between equals is one of the oldest laws of civilization from the very beginning, from the Ur Namu rules, from the Babylonian code, Hammurabi code. The concept of, of equality and meeting of minds is fundamental. And that means that you can't contract with a mountain. You can't set up an agreement with a cow. You can't set up an agreement with a corporation. Why? Because you're not equal. Now the argument that says, well, you're a natural person and they're a person, so it's a meaning, is ridiculous. A corporation does not have a mind. And what we see with this infection that pervades the legal fraternity, which is called legal realism, is that they are so stupid now, they don't even look at the fundamental principles. They just look at how much money to make and they see this as a problem that can be swept under the carpet. They don't see maxims as principles to sustain the system. They see it as an obstacle, something to be moved out of the way. Contracts are effective because you believe them to be effective, because you keep your promises. But there is nothing in the maxims of law that say a, a contract must be kept. An agreement must be kept, yes, because of the meaning of minds. But if there's no meaning of minds, if none of those principles we went through in terms of agreement apply to a contract, then contracts are nothing more than confidence tricks. Trickery, corporate force, corporate theft. They have no foundation in law and they are unsustainable in law. It brings me to the wrap-up tonight. We're going to talk about banking, but I want to talk again about where we're at in terms of research. This week, I was shown by uh, one of the guys that's doing some fantastic stuff. His name is uh, Bios Matt. And it was a definition of private property that was posted as a theological argument for the Catholic Church, where it basically said that, the, that private property ownership was absolutely supported. It wasn't only simply supported, but it was considered now a natural right of men and women. And then it went in to say that all the arguments of God granting dominion of the earth was all a bit of a, uh, a mistake, that uh, yes, you know, God created property rights, but it was up for grabs and the first in best dressed. And when I read it, my heart sank. Because I wasn't looking at the work of some brilliant Machiavellian evil genius of the 16th century that structured the common law system. I wasn't looking at the law of Blackstones and Cokes that set up the concept of person and the system that we see today. What I was looking at is the clumsy butchery of the hired gun of some corporate banking family that wants to stay in power and that can't be bothered reading Thomas Aquinas or any of the history of their own system that has no discipline in logic and just thinks that if they say these things and there's no objection that they hold. Their system has been broken irreparably by themselves. You know why bankruptcies can't be more than seven years in theory? Because it was one of the fundamental rules of the Torah, it was one of the fundamental rules of the, of the Talmud. But they don't follow the Talmud anymore. They don't follow it anymore. It means that they've been supposedly and technically turning over the bankruptcy of the Rothschild since the 19th century every seven years. Well, I see no evidence of that being handled effectively and judiciously. 
Their system is 